Well, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. Oh, I'm so I'm coming. I'm so I'm so tickled. Uh, when Ramona asked me to talk about my writing, I jumped at the chance because nobody's ever asked me that before, and I haven't really had a chance to think about it. Uh, but uh, starting right in on on your question, uh, I use the word fascist. Uh, if you re if you remember or listened carefully to the way I was using it, I didn't use it. Actually, I was quoting the head of the conservative political action uh, conference, uh, who used the term yesterday. Uh, he called the alt right a bunch of. Now he didn't just use the word fascist. He said they were lefty fascists. Uh, I thought it was sort of an interesting concept. Uh, but I thought it was interesting to, for him to use the word. And I thought, I, I'm not going to use the word. It's not going to come from me. But to come from the head of the biggest conservative conference yearly in Washington, at which Donald Trump and all the Republicans uh, speak, uh, I thought it was sort of an important thing to relate that he used that word. So you thought about that before you started? Not before I started. I tend not to think very much about what I say before I start. Now, how can I put this? Um, I, when, I, when I said about rage, I find it very helpful to be angry in talking about what's going on right now. I can be more articulate when I am angrier. How is that possible, you might ask? Well, I use a system that I call the trapeze system of public oratory. The trapeze system of public oratory is, if you can envision yourself just about as an, as an acrobat or a, as a trapeze artist, you are just on the platform and a trapeze uh, a, a kind of a trapeze is coming toward you. Do you can see? Can you see that? I'm, I'm visualizing oh, okay, it. Okay, visualizing it. And you begin a sentence or a paragraph. You don't know where you're going, but you have faith that if you hold on, you will then get to another trapeze that is moving. <laughs> you this is the new five paragraph essay. Yes. I can't describe it in any, in any better. And it sounds weird. And it sounds sort of West Coasty. But, <laughs> but I have found over the years, and maybe it's just because I've spent a lot of time speaking, that it is the easiest way to speak coherently for me. The combination of outrage or anger or indignation with this notion of, well, just trust. Just trust that one thing will lead to the next thing, and that your mind is capable of actually providing a halfway coherent address. And even if it's not, if you sound halfway coherent, people will think it is. <laughs> OK. Well, that's good that you brought that up, because I'm really curious whether that's the way you write. Do you let your rage direct you as you write? Is it as unmeditated? So I'm going to use a paragraph from Aftershock. And I'd like you just to talk about your writing practices. You know, how much you revise, when you write, do you write onto the computer, um, when do you send it to your editor? So. You want me to read it out loud? Sure. OK. Since the, you speak as, so well. As the, rich, <laughs> as the rich have grown richer while the middle class has lost hope, children from wealthy families have been an increasing advantage in this race. They attend high quality private high schools, accessible only to families wealthy enough to live in the area they serve, which amounts to the same thing, while the quality of public schools available to most families has declined. All right. Well, um, I do not write as I speak. I write in a much more labored way. It is much harder for me to write a book. I mean, an essay or an op-ed I can write 
uh, and I do write out of rage and outrage and anger and whatever. Uh, and that's an easy 700 words I can manage. Like this, but, uh, the limping middle class, that was easy for you to write? Very easy. Yeah. You remember? I don't remember. Oh. But, but, <laughs> but, but, but op-eds are very, very easy. What is hard is, a, is an argument that is sustained over 900 or 100,000 words, 90,000 or 100,000 words. That requires a great deal of preparation, uh, an outline, or at least I have to begin with a sense of where I'm going, and a lot of rewriting. I mean, a huge amount of rewriting. The only thing that I do there is I try to get out as much as I can, as quickly as I can, because I know I'm going to have to rewrite it a thousand times. Um, so um, where does, just out of curiosity, where does your editor step in? Uh, at the very end. So you'll hand in almost complete? I'll, I'll hand in a manuscript that is whatever, 90,000 words. And uh, John Siegel, who's been my editor, uh, does basically a style edit. I mean, he may take a look at a draft, and he occasionally has looked at a draft of a book, and he'll say, you know, this last half of the book doesn't work. You've got to rewrite, and I'll tell you why it doesn't work. He did that with Aftershock, as a matter of fact. What, what did he tell you? Uh, he said, when I, my, first, uh, my first draft, uh, I use the second half of the book as a kind of dystopian look at what will happen in the future unless we, rev we, we uh, return to an economy that was where prosperity, prosperity was much more broadly shared. Uh, and that dystopian view was obviously fictionalized. I mean, it was a work of fiction. The first half of the book was a work of fact and analysis. The second half of the book was a work of dystopian fiction. And he said they didn't work together. Mm. It just was too confusing. And so I went back and rewrote the second half. Of course, now, six or seven years later, I wish I hadn't because my dystopian view of the future has come true. <laughs> So is that the subject of your next book, which I understand you're starting? And would you tell us a little bit how you, what's, when you're starting a new project, what's happening to you? And yeah, I, I, the, the new project is going to be a book called The Common Good. And How'd you come up with that title? <laughs> <laughs> well, the titles I come up with really bear nothing and no relationship to anything. I, I just, I come up with a title because it's, it has to do with what I am very excited and angry about or worried about. or uh, And I wanted to write an anti-Trump book, but without mentioning Trump. <laughs> because I figured there are going to be so many books, and there has already been so much writing about Donald Trump and who he is and what he's doing. And, but I wanted to get behind Trump. I don't think Trump is the most interesting phenomenon today. I think Donald Trump is a symptom of a populist wave that has both an authoritarian aspect to it, as exemplified by Trump, but also a very progressive aspect of it, uh, to it, as exemplified by Bernie Sanders. Mm. Uh, and it, it upsets me that Bernie Sanders, having lost the Democratic primary, it's as if he has somehow been erased from history. Uh, nobody is talking about him any longer, uh, and most they talk about Hillary Clinton. But Bernie Sanders was really the historic uh, major historic figure given what happened in 2016. And he is the embodiment of a different kind of populism. Assuming, let's define populism as indignation directed toward elites uh, because of economic, primarily economic hardship. Uh, and let's assume, for the sake of the discussion, that authoritarian populism uses that anger and indignation and channels it toward rage against not only economic elites, but also immigrants and minorities and anybody who's different, and uses that scapegoating as a way of building power. Mm -hmm. And let's assume that the progressive or small d democratic side of populism uses that indignation and rage to 
make major political reforms and major economic reforms, which is what Bernie Sanders was campaigning on. So the common good is a way of putting essentially not Bernie Sanders specific polit political uh, ideas, but the movement that he embodied into a larger context. And also to make the case for patriotism that is defined not as we're the best or we exclude you, but defined very differently as what are the responsibilities and duties we owe one another as members of the same society? So um, I guess I'm wondering if you always used rage when you were writing in order to make such a persuasive argument. I mean, if Aristotle was around today, he would adore you, I think. Um, but since we have a lot of undergraduates here, um, when you were an undergraduate, how did you write? What, as, do you remember writing your essays? Do you remember a professor that once upon a time inspired you? Um, I know I'm shifting from the important political commentary you're making about what you're going to be writing, but I'm just, and we can get no, back a, to that. Uh, Ramon, it's all the same. It's all, you were like this in college? I hate to say it, I was. <laughs> um, so you didn't have trouble doing your homework and... Um, I did, I did. I mean, I empathize. I, I had a huge amount of homework and I enjoyed my subjects, uh, but I got very involved in politics because I couldn't help it. At that time, you know, I, a, a very good friend of mine uh, was murdered in the civil rights movement. That got me, got my attention very, very much focused. And then we had the Vietnam War, and the war was escalating, and another friend of mine was, was killed in the war. And uh, we were being all being drafted, uh, and I faced the draft uh, in a year or two after I graduated. And so I said to myself, uh, I didn't even say to myself, there wasn't even a conscious point at which I said anything. I just was writing uh, about civil rights, about social inequity, uh, I didn't write, it was not just a rampage. It was not just uh, a, a, a screed. I, I tried to avoid screeds. I tried to use, to the extent that I could, logic and reason and facts, uh, and tried to write in such a way as I, I could be persuasive, persuasive. But I was aware that there was a very important emotional element mm. that I also needed and wanted in my writing. Uh, that if I lacked the emotional element, I would not actually pull people in. Right. Pathos. So um, you've always been a citizen activist writer. And your writing, it sounds like, has always been part of your activism and part of you being a citizen. So we've seen that, I think, a lot with your books. But let's turn to some of your more imaginative work. I would call a memoir imaginative. Um, so, and talk, I, I have two different passages, um, and talk about these, how you're using the memoir here as part of your activism. Also, as we'll see here, one of them is about a political scene, and one of them is about a personal scene. And clearly, you're reworking the personal is the political, the political is the personal. And I think you're trying to be humorous, too. So. Um, Let's look at these two passages, one about uh, your first moment in the administration at the cabinet meeting, and the next, a little scene from a marriage. Okay, this is uh, from March 7th, uh, 19, I guess it was 1993. Uh, I, was ca I was in the cabinet, um, and my, uh, it says, our first cabinet meeting. The purpose of this meeting, it seems, is to come up with symbolic ways to show taxpayers we intend to do government on the cheap. Bill asks for suggestions. That was Bill Clinton. Uh, quote, I've reduced our fleet of limousines from five to two, unquote, says one proud member of the cabinet, unquote. Uh, another, I've got rid of all of them, them all, unquote, says another, trumping the first. Uh, quote, I've closed the entire, the executive dining room, unquote, says a third. 
Damn, that was what I was going to brag about. <laughs> Ideas are flying. It's an orgy of austerity. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I, um, I do remember that moment. <laughs> you remember that moment? Yeah. Do you remember the writing of that moment? I, I, I sort of do. I remember the moments much more than I do remember the writing. Uh, Samuel Pepys uh, once said that the, and I can't, obviously quote him directly, but paraphrasing, said that one of the great things about, about writing a memoir um, or autobiography is you, you actually have the event, and then you have the writing of the event, and then you have the memory of writing the event and the event, mm. and it's kind of a three or fourfold enjoyment of so life. Are you having that right now? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. I'm actually having the enjoyment of, of remembering that particular event. So is this, did this really happen? Uh, yeah, it did happen. It did. I don't, I mean, I'm not I mean, remembering an event that did not happen. And yeah, that happened. It happened. I, you know, I, I, I was accused in the paperback edition, uh, no, in the hardback edition of this book, I was accused by some people of embellishing. They said, how could I remember, possibly remember, actually detailed dialogue? And I had taken notes uh, to myself. I was not anticipating writing a memoir, but I had taken notes, and I rem my, my memory was pretty accurate. Uh, they caught me out on a couple of things, and I changed them uh, for the paperback edition. But basically, um, it was very helpful for me uh, to take notes at the time. And it was also helpful, and this goes back to the rage and anger and passion point which I had not connected with this book until this moment. Oh. Uh, when I left the cabinet, I was really pissed off. Uh, Bill Clinton had moved to the center. He had abandoned a lot of his campaign promises. I was furious. Uh, and I was making a lot of personal sacrifices. I had not seen anything of my kids uh, for, well, for much of the f of four years. Uh, and I had sacrificed my life for Bill Clinton. And uh, so I left. I told him I was resigning. I didn't tell him why, but I was, I was furious. And it took me several years to get my equilibrium back. And writing this was very therapeutic. So, so it was a therapeutic and cathartic for you, but was there, did you feel there was something politically you were intending oh, with yes. that? Oh, yes. I wanted what, to, what I wanted you, to were make- Were you exposing? No, it was not a kiss and tell book at all. I wanted to make the case, my case, for why major public investments in education, job training, basic research and development, and the infrastructure that connected everybody together, uh, and healthcare, why those public investments were at least as important as private investments in a modern economy. Huh. And I wanted to make the case because I was so frustrated that I could not make it when I was in the cabinet. And I thought that the best way of making it, maybe a good way of making it, was through a memoir. Uh -huh. Because I was making, I was fighting these fights in the cabinet. And then I also realized when I was writing the memoir that if I put it in the present tense, rather than the past tense, it would have a little bit more punch. And so, I don't know if we'll spend, because I want to open up the floor and I want to get to some of your multi-platforming, but I did put up a quote here of a fight with your wife. Oh, that was at the beginning of, um, and she said, quote, I've got to stay in Washington. Oh, I say. You say oh, this that. Is, this you wish she had said yes, that. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's right, that's right. This was in uh, 19, this is 1990. I think you had already been there. Four. I'd been there for yeah. several years. Yeah. And she had come down with me for two years. <laughs> and uh, I said to her, I've got to stay in Washington, unquote. I say to Claire, as we reach the summit, I guess you were walking. Yes. Um, uh, she's, uh, quote, she says, would you be willing to commute, see us on, on the weekend? And these are my two little boys, and this is a commute to Boston, which is not all that easy when I'm working all week, 16 hours a day. And I say, no, unquote, quote, unquote. I thunder. The loudness and definitiveness of the response surprises even me. Claire looks hurt. I feel badly about the outburst. Quote, look, 
I say, trying to sound reasonable. Can't you get a third year of leave? The boys certainly can bear one more year of Washington. And then uh, we skip down. I, I cut out some of the fight. I just can't abandon Bill and the Department of Labor and everything I believe in, not now. And she says, what about your family? Yes. So I'm wondering, why did you include that scene? Do you remember why you would include I telling us um, and having your wife say, what about your family? I mean, it makes us wonder about your ability to multitask, for example. Well, I couldn't multitask. One of the, one of I the, mean, one what, of the did you, what were you trying to achieve uh, by bringing in this personal... Well, there are personal um, vignettes all the way through the memoir. Right. Because I wanted people to see the life of a cabinet member in a three-dimensional way. Uh, but I also wanted to, them to see my life in a three-dimensional way. Uh, and this particular scene was one of the most, was kind of the culmination of a deepening frustration and a deepening uh, sense of anxiety and angst that I experienced, and that was that I was trying to be a father to two little boys. At the same time, I was trying to do a job that required 12 to 16 hour days, five or six or sometimes seven days a week. And I was trying to uphold the left side of the Bill Clinton cabinet at the time that he's moving to the middle. And I was losing fight after fight. Now, I had only been there two years when my wife said to me she wanted to go home. And I was furious. I wanted her support. I wanted her to stay there with me, with the boys. Because if I, I knew that if I, I, I was, that her leaving and my commuting would make the tension that I was feeling between work and family that much worse. And maybe on some, I don't know if this was something you were thinking, but it, telling us about that not only makes you three dimensional, but I think it allows us to see the types of tensions that come into one's personal life when you are a citizen activist and, when, and the types of decisions that one has to make. Perhaps there was something of that. I, 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 I think that's right. When I finally, uh, two or three years after that, resigned, um, I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times called My Family Leave Policy, or something like that. That's what they titled it. Um, but I said in that op-ed, I explained, and that was the day I left, actually. I, I, I explained that I could not any longer, and it wasn't a matter of balancing. I said the whole idea of balancing work and family was a silly idea. How do you balance work you love with a family you love when, when you don't have nearly the capacity to do either of them fully? Uh, and I said in that op-ed that I had reached the end point. I could not any longer even try. Hmm. Well. One thing I think I remember is that you were the first person I heard use the word multi-platform, that you were going multi-platform. And you told me you had heard about it because of your son, that he was the one that pushed you to start embracing different platforms. And um, I'd like to just, I, 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 we're running out of time because I want to open up the floor to talk about Professor Reich's writing and any questions you might have. But I've compiled um, from your Twitter account, from your blog, um, and maybe one other thing. Um, and I want, if we could for a moment, talk about what audience, having moved to this new social media, are you trying to now reach? Um, we talked a little bit about how you don't want to talk to the converted already. Maybe you're starting to talk to Republicans. Who's, who's suddenly becoming that? How do you use social media for that? We've, I think we've learned speaking together today that you are able to write short things very easily. So I won't ask you about that. I don't know if you revise. But could we just look at, start with a, one Twitter. On February 18th, 2017, 
This is not normal, friends. Trump poses a clear and present danger to American democracy. I think that's true. So you, uh, would you retweet that right now? Would I retweet it right now? Yes. For you? For us. No, uh, I'm just. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, no, I'm, but I know you think I it's true. I, but, but what? But I mean, let like, me let me let me let me back up just a little bit yeah. because um, uh, one of the two little boys who I was trying to be a good father to when I was in the cabinet uh, is named Sam, and when I came back from the cabinet, uh, Sam was then twelve, and he. Four years later, at the age of 16, uh, he said to me and to his mother that he, and he was doing very well in high school, he said he was leaving high school, uh, but we shouldn't worry. He's dropping out of high school, but not to worry because he wants to get involved in two separate industries, uh, in, in the internet, and also he wants to make films. And I said to him, well, why both of those? He said, because, Dad, uh, in a few years, they'll, bo they'll both come together, and I want to be right there when they do. And I said, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and also I said, you need a college education. Uh, I am a professor, and I teach in college, and I believe everybody needs a college education, and you can't leave high school. And he said, well, Dad, I am leaving, but don't worry about it, because I'm moving in with Elaine. <laughs> And we're moving downtown, and I have a job, and I also have made, I've, I've made inroads in this, uh, in this, in this intersection between the internet and the and film, and I think it's going to work. <coughs> well, uh, now we are in. He's now 32. He was 16 then, so he was half the age he is now, and now he's president of something called CollegeHumor.com, uh, and. <laughs> He's making movies for television, and he's married to Elaine, uh, and he, you know, he loves what he does. And I was wrong. Uh, but he came to me about five years ago and said, Dad, you're writing a lot of articles and books, and I think that's great, but do you really want to reach people? And I said, Sam, why do you think I'm writing? <laughs> he said, because you really, if you want to reach people, you really do need to understand and utilize uh, the social media and videos. And you, you, you've got to get on the internet and, and Facebook and, and Twitter and Tumblr and all of these other things. I said, I don't know anything you're talking about. And half the words you just used are foreign to me. <laughs> and he basically sat me down very patiently and helped me. Uh, you know, just said, this is how you set up a Facebook account. This is how you start Tumblr. This is how you do this and that. Uh, and I really credit him. I, now, I, was, I went through a, sm a small depression for about two weeks because I thought, well, wait a minute. Why am I writing if nobody's reading what I'm writing? <laughs> uh, but then I thought, well, wait a minute. This is really an opportunity because there are all these other things I could be doing. I, I don't want to stop writing, and I'm not going to stop writing, but maybe there are ways of reaching people that I haven't actually explored. Uh, and uh, that was the beginning. And so with, with uh, and I don't know what this means to you. I don't like Twitter very much. I don't, you I, don't. it's just, I, it, I do it, but it's not, it's just too confining. I like Facebook. What's confining, you mean the word limit? Yeah, I just didn't like, it just seems too artificial. Well, I had to search to find a complete sentence. Because a lot of times you'll do the beginning and then yeah. you'll link it to something. Well, it's, I, I link my Facebook to it. To right, I saw it. But, but there are certain times you really do. Yeah, occasionally. I mean, I thought this was February 18th was right on. Yeah. But uh, my, my point is that I, um, I started to do more uh, video and uh, found Yael and uh, also another young man who really wanted to do video and wanted to do documentaries. And we did a documentary called Inequality for All, which got an award at the, um, the uh, what is that? The Academy Award? No, no it wasn't an Academy <laughs> Award. It's Sundance, Sundance. At the Sundance <laughs> Film Festival. Uh, I wish it did win a record Wasn't Academy it nominated? Uh, but uh, it's been a really interesting experience. 
uh, to try to utilize different kinds of platforms to make similar kinds of arguments mm. that I would make in print. And that would be a good essay topic for any of you. Um, and you can write it in my class if you want. But now I'm going to open it up so the students can ask you more questions. If they want, I have more text if you want to look at it. But would you like to um, choose people yeah, or do anybody. you want me to do it? Sure, yes. Yeah, you mentioned a lot of your speeches. Um, so you mentioned a lot of your speech is motivated by rage, and it seems to flow out very, as was described, uh, as though you'd pre-written it. Um, as an individual who has trouble with this layer of abstraction, from going from here to mouth, how do you overcome the barrier of the layer of abstraction that goes from brain to hands to laptop to printed? It, it seems to be a long, it, it seems it's harder to formulate thoughts on page cohesively um, and make it sound as good as it does in speech. How would you overcome that barrier? Well, first of all, uh, you are fortunate if you are a good typist. Uh, I, you know, I type very, very fast. And I tend to type exactly what I'm thinking. It's not always coherent. And I do have to go back and do uh, revision. But when I revise, I ask myself, if it's a short piece, if it's an essay, if it's an op-ed, I ask myself, or if even for Facebook, I ask myself, um, is it clear? Is it it's simple and clear. I just want every sentence to be as simple as possible. I, want, I don't want there to be any complicated words that are unnecessarily complicated. I, want, I don't want to talk down to my audience, but I, want, I just want clarity. Would I really like to read this? This is what I ask myself every day. And I must probably spend maybe three or four hours a day writing. Is that helpful? Do you write in the morning, or do you have a specific time when you write? I write um, from about 7.30 in the morning to about 9 o'clock. And then I'll write for another stretch. I'll find two hours or three hours during the day. writing and the words, especially if it's about an experience, sometimes they don't completely represent what that experience is. Is there a process or something that you go through so that you feel like when you're writing about an experience, your words are augmenting that experience instead of somehow making it less real? Well, it's a good question. And I think my only closest experience was my memoir. And what I had to do then was recreate for myself, first of all, how I felt, and then the images and smells and tastes and anything else <laughs> that would help me convey how I felt. And then, once I had all that, I could go about writing. Humor, it turned out, was very important in that process. I didn't realize it would be, but that helped me be more authentic to what I had experienced. Is that, I don't know if that's helpful at all. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just thinking like, sometimes when you're trying to write and you have to go over the experience over and over and over again, how do you uh, make sure that you're staying true to that experience? Oh, I see. So when you're, when you're writing and you have to go over and over and over it, how do you maintain truth to that experience without getting too, too distant from it just yeah. because it's so many drafts away? Right. Well, I, I would save my first draft. Hmm. And, and use it as a reference point. Because there is always the problem. And in fact, this is true of nonfiction as well. There's always the problem of getting too far away from what you really originally intended. Did also over here. Yes. Hi. Um, which authors inspire you and do you try to emulate in your own writing? Um, for a long time, John Kenneth Galbraith was the person who inspired me and I tried to emulate. He, if you don't recognize the name, he was an economist and political scientist, a political economist at Harvard. He was the closest thing I had to a mentor and uh, a, a wonderful man in terms of his, his intellect. Uh, he wasn't a delightful person interpersonally. He was 
he was rather narcissistic. I shouldn't say this about somebody who's no longer with us, but he was. Uh, <laughs> uh, but he was, uh, he was a wonderful writer, and he managed, and he was, a, he was an eloquent writer, and he wrote about economics and politics in a way that I always, from the first time I read one of his books when I was a teenager, I thought, wow, I would love to be able to write like this. And he was the, I guess he was the primary in, uh, inspiration. Hi. <clears throat> so I follow you on Facebook, and I always notice that your comment section on your videos is um, really active. And I was just sort of wondering how you um, engage with that sort of direct feedback or your thoughts on some of the more interesting comments or, or the wide range of comments you receive on your stuff. Um, I tend to only look at the top comments, that is, the, the comments that attract the most number of likes, uh, because I don't have time to go through more than that. And uh, that gives me some guidance as to whether I am getting my points across. Uh, and also, it's interesting uh, in terms of what other people say that other people find particularly useful. Is that, and I don't, I don't normally comment on comments on Facebook page, but occasionally I do. If I feel like somebody, some comment is really important or occasionally, although I try not to do it, if I feel like somebody has misunderstood me. Um, one principle I've tried to use, it's, it's, somewhat, it's been somewhat hard, but I've tried to, and that is never to get into the trap of talking about myself when I'm actually intending to talk about an issue. And many people in this day and age particularly, when the social media uh, is filled with ad hominem attacks and personal attacks, uh, it is very it's very tempting to fall into that trap and respond defensively or personally, and I tried desperately not to. Yep. Hi, um, I'm curious, you talk about Twitter a lot and the way that you use Twitter, and I'm curious if you think that it's changing the way we see the issues we're discussing, making them oversimplified or too black and white when there's so much gray to most of these things we're talking about right now. Well, that's why I don't use Twitter. Yeah. Um, I, I use Facebook uh, and Tumblr. I mean, I, basically, my writing, uh, I suppose I divide up my writing between what I'd like to do is most of my writing uh, on a book project, uh, and then secondarily on long form uh, Facebook, which might be called an op-ed. And I, and I write, I, I, I do write for the Chronicle Weekly, and that's syndicated, uh, and uh, Business Week picks it up every week. Uh, and then um, I write, I do Facebook, uh, and, I do, and Facebook is the easiest and quickest and takes no effort at all. I basically paraphrase things I find, I kind of curate, uh, and maybe add my own views and opinions. Uh, but, but, but Twitter is the least, I just enjoy it the least. So to get to your question, I think that Twitter does uh, simplify, get rid of all nuance, and actually make us all very lazy. Uh, I think Facebook, to some extent, does that too. And the challenge with Facebook, for me, is to condense an argument to make it as simple as possible without doing any damage to the nuance in the argument. Let's take one more question and then we're going to end with a surprise. <laughs> Anybody? Over here, I think you. Okay. Um, when you're dealing with something as abstract as... Where are you? I have oh, no I'm, idea. I'm over here. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Um, when, when you're dealing with something as abstract as emotion that's motivating you to write or your topic is abstract, whether it's political theory or economic theory, how do you actually then go from that abstract uh, kind of thought process down to the minutia that really underpins your argument? And then, most importantly... If you don't happen to be an incredibly successful former Secretary of Labor, how do you actually get it published? Uh, well, uh, the first question is, from the abstract to the particular, uh, 
I start with a particular uh, and then provide a, a broader principle that that particular issue uh, illustrates. Uh, now, if I possibly can, and, I, and if I have time, I actually like to start with a personal anecdote uh, that get broad, draws somebody in, uh, because uh, there's nothing like a little tiny personal story, even if it's two sentences, that gives somebody almost a permission to get inside an argument. And then I'll go to the particulars of a particular of an issue, and then I'll end with a larger, more abstract uh, framing. Is that helpful? Uh, I had something that I was going to say right in the middle of that, and I can't remember what it was. Oh, yes, you also said, how do you get it published? Um, I, I'm old enough to remember when it was pretty easy to get published in a magazine. I mean, we had in this country a lot of magazines, hard, I mean, physical magazines. Now we, now we have uh, uh, internet-based magazines. I think it's, it's different because a lot of things get, get buried. I mean, when, you, when I would have a little article in Harper's, for example, uh, it wasn't a big, big magazine, but it didn't get buried the way things get buried today on the internet. It was, it was at least something people had a reference point, uh, you know, or the Atlantic, uh, or um, I used to write occasionally, and I, I actually I was co-founder of a, a little magazine, only comes out now four or five times a year, called The American Prospect. Uh, but each of those was, was a little flag, and that little flag did attract uh, some loyal readers. Uh, I don't know how now it's possible to write on, in social media, on the internet, in such a way that you begin to attract people on the basis of your own brand rather than a flag that is the Atlantic or some other flag. I think it's hard. Uh, maybe what that, all that means, and I'm thinking out loud obviously, is that you want to find a, uh, a respectable brand on the internet like the American Prospect or the Atlantic and begin developing an audience there. Okay, I think this is unpublished, but I'm not entirely sure. You wrote a play. I did. I've seen, I've heard it read. I don't believe it's published, is that correct? It's not published. And you were kind enough to send me this part of this play. So I'd like to end with introducing Robert Reich, the fiction writer. And um, this is a play called Milton and Augusto. It's a fictional account of a 1975 meeting between the economist Milton Friedman and General Augusto Pinochet. And I thought as an ending and as your public, we have an art of writing button for you, Colleen, an art of writing button for Professor Reich. We're going to give it to you now. And allow you to become a public figure of fiction. So, which I'm sure you are already, but um, I, here's a little excerpt. So would you spend uh, just a moment reading it, or maybe you want someone in the audience to be Milton, if you want to be the general, and just tell us what made you write this? How was it writing in fiction? Thank you, Colleen, so much. Here's your official button. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, well, I, I, I've always, actually, this is almost a secret, but I've always written plays. Uh -huh. And some of them have been produced. In fact, uh, one play that I'm so pleased nobody has discovered, <laughs> because I'm, I'm sort of ashamed of it. It was produced uh, in Santa Rosa at the Playhouse about 10 years ago. And uh, its East Coast premiere was on Cape Cod. And I'm ashamed of, I'm not really ashamed of it, but it, it's a farce. And it is a, kind of a bedroom farce and it is kind of filthy. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a it's a comedy, it's a comedy, it is a comedy, uh, but uh, it doesn't really fit my image any longer. Um, 
<laughs> so, uh, but this, this particular play has not been produced. This is, uh, I did this, I wrote this because I, I was fascinated uh, about what might have happened when the great economist, great conservative economist, Milton Friedman, actually, he did meet with Augusto Pinochet, uh, who was the dictator, a ruthless dictator in Chile. Uh, and the meeting I knew took place, but there was no, I could find no transcript, and nobody knew what actually occurred in the meeting. So I thought, what a great opportunity to make up, uh, quite explicitly make it up. I mean, I have a play that was explicitly a made up version of what might have happened. So, uh, yeah, do you want to play Milton? I'll do the general. Okay. It's not a, I mean, it's not a lot of... I don't have a lot to say. No, I don't, well, <laughs> uh, the, general, the general says, uh, we are about the same age, a time of life when a man begins to think about what he has achieved. Both of us came from uh, modest roots. Both your parents and mine emigrated to this hemisphere, although I... Do not know where yours came from. Cartho, Luthania. Uh, where is that? It was a province of Austria-Hungary, later Czechoslovakia, now a part of the Soviet Union. And then the general says, are you Jewish? I am sorry to hear that. Oh, what's we going on? <laughs> I don't remember. Are you writing? Oh, I don't sorry. remember. Ah, <laughs> you Jewish. <laughs> oh, okay. So the general says. <laughs> That's I, why I said I am sorry says, to hear that. Says, the general says, I'm sorry to hear that. Milton. <laughs> I was born in Brooklyn. Oh, Chileans love the Brooklyn Dodgers. Really? Why is that? Because we all hate the Yankees. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> You had a confidential matter. And that, that's the excerpt. Oh, that's the excerpt. OK. <laughs> so we'd love to publish your play on our Art of Writing website, everyone, artofwriting.berkeley.edu, if you want to publish with us. We're there for you. Um, thank you, everybody. But thank you so much for taking the time to be here. I know how busy you are, and I feel like we're taking you away from many other people. So no, thank listen, you. Uh, thank you all. And I just want to say, I, I do love writing. I, it's an honor to be here with you. Uh, I also uh, love teaching. And I do sincerely, sincerely believe that we are members of the most important and successful intellectual community in the United States, if not the world. This university, there is second to none. I believe that. So thank you all. <laughs>